Okay, so we're, uh, we're here today to look at uh, the George Square statues. Uh, George Square is the main public space in Glasgow. Glasgow obviously is the largest uh, city in Scotland. So this is a very significant public space uh, in Scotland. And, and really the, the statues are for, for the people of Glasgow very much part of uh, their lives. They walk past them every day in an extremely uh, important um, part of the city and, and the visual imagery of the city. Um, but one of the interesting things that's happened with the, the square is that the council, which obviously owns and runs the square, has repeatedly attempted to remove the statues uh, for various reasons um, which they give. And we'll be talking about that as we go along. Now, just to uh, explain, first of all, we need to remember that the, the, the character of the square has very much changed over the years. Um, when the statues first started arriving in the square, um, this was eff effectively a housing area. We were surrounded entirely by uh, domestic space, uh, and, and really what we stood on now was the gardens of those houses. But it's, as it's become a public square, as the city's moved westwards from the medieval um, area, which is over there, um, to the east, and the, the city moved moved through the 18th and 19th century westwards and the square became pretty much the centre of the city and as a result many public buildings are around and most obviously those behind me you can see city chambers the home of the of the city council um, and in front of that the cenotaph which is the most recent arrival in the square of the of the significant monuments i'm not going to be talking about the cenotaph today we're going to be talking about the figurative statues that go all the way around it um, of which there are 12 um, almost all of which arrived during the 19th century um, the last one actually arrived in 1902, so it's, it's pretty much Victorian spacing out of the square. As I say, the characters changed and the statues have moved and that's changed and we'll be, we'll be talking about that uh, as we go along. Um, but getting back to this issue of the removal of the statues that the, um, the council has attempted, um, it really starts in the 1950s when a lot of the myths about the square and the statues um, start up. And we have to um, deal, with, I think, with some of those questions because one of the things that the council really tries to get across whenever they try to remove the statues is that these are no longer representative of Glasgow. They're of the past. They don't mean anything to Glasgow. And whenever there's an attempt to remove the statues, the people of Glasgow say, well, they mean something to the people of Glasgow. And there's always um, enormous opposition. Most recently, in 2013, uh, when there was a massive campaign to save the statues, which was successful. But one of the things that the council is saying is that these aren't representative of Glasgow. And really what I want to do as we walk around is to think about the place of these statues in Glasgow's history, what they tell us about Glasgow, the Glasgowness, if you like, of the statues themselves and, and the history they tell of the city. So we'll go around them one by one. We'll be starting in the northeastern corner, uh, which is over there, and we'll head over there now and, and have a chat about that chap over there. Okay, so here we are in front of the first statue we're going to look at. This is James Oswald of Ochincrew. An inter interesting place to start because he's perhaps the least famous person on the square. Now, a little bit of social history to begin with. He's known um, after uh, he's erected um, as um, the man with the hat for uh, fairly obvious reasons. Um, he has his, his open hat uh, in his left hand. Now, actually, what, one thing that started to happen very early on is that boys turn this statue into a game, throwing stones into his hat to try and make them stay there and not bounce out. And apparently, on a weekly basis, the council would have to come along here with a ladder and remove um, the stones that were collecting in his hat. It's not something that seems to be done anymore, but it's a very important uh, image, I think, particularly of early 20th century uh, versions of this, of this statue. Now, Oswald himself is a politician. He's um, a radical liberal. He's arguing for the reform of Parliament in the 1830s, 1820s and 1830s. And he's one of the main speakers at the massive reform demonstration that takes place on Glasgow Green in 1831. And after the passage of the Great Reform Act in 1832, he becomes Glasgow's MP. 
in the reformed parliament. So he represents a reforming radical tradition here in Glasgow. And he particularly does this on the reasons that he comes here. The statue is not originally in George Square. Of the 12 we're gonna be looking at, 10 are made and, and put in George Square from the very beginning. Two are moved in, and this is one of them. It's originally erected the year after his death at Sandyford Place in Charing Cross, which is a developing commercial and uh, domestic district um, to the west of the city. Um, but not long after he comes in, the statue to Robert Peel, which we'll be looking at later, comes in. Now Robert Peel um, has his reasons for being here in Glasgow, but he is a Tory Prime Minister. And Glasgow is not a Tory city, it is a liberal city, it is a radical city. And there is enormous opposition to Peel arriving as a Tory. And in particular, because Oswald has been put out on the far reaches of the city, his friends immediately start campaigning for this Glaswegian, because you know he represents Glasgow and Peel isn't from Glasgow, a Glaswegian and radical liberal counterweight to the non-Glaswegian Tory who has been brought into the square. And in 1875 he arrives as that counterweight to non-Glasgow Toryism. And that's why he's here. In the early 20th century he becomes one of the more popular figures, particularly because of this stone throwing. And he, he appears briefly um, in literary history um, here in Glasgow. Because in the early 20th century, this is a possibly apocryphal story, but it keeps coming up in literary histories of the period. Joseph Conrad, the great novelist, is here in Glasgow. And he's having, um, I think, a rather boozy lunch uh, with the Scottish novelist Neil Munro in the Millennium Hotel here on the square. And Munro convinces Conrad um, that you become an honorary citizen of Glasgow if you manage to throw the stone into the hat and it not bounce out. And Conrad comes here and on his first attempt throws a stone and keeps it in the hat. And Conrad becomes, at least in Munro's eyes, an honorary citizen of Glasgow. And it's a nice little story because it brings in that kind of, that huge Human elements. We have the boys throwing stones, and we have um, we have these great figures coming in here, and it, it representing Glasgow and the citizenry um, of Glasgow, while also, as I say, representing this political tradition that is here in the city. Okay, so uh, here we have um, Thomas Graham, uh, born in Glasgow, and one of the great chemists of the 19th century. Uh, he first studies at Glasgow University to be a minister, but while he's there he decides um, that really science is his thing and he moves to Edinburgh um, to study chemistry. He goes on to teach at Edinburgh and eventually becomes the professor of chemistry at the Andersonian Institute, which is one of the training institutes, becomes part of what is now Strathclyde University in the city of Glasgow. He's, he's, um, he's famous for such work as the, well, Graham's Law and the diffusion of gases. He's seen as the father of colloid chemistry and he does extremely important work on the composition um, of meteorites. Um, but the reason he's here really, although he was born in Glasgow, so he is a Glaswegian, but the reason he's here is that the statue is gifted by one very, very wealthy individual, um, a James Young. James Young is generally known as Powerfin Young. He's the man who effectively founded the oil and chemical industries here in Scotland. Um, and, and had been a student of Graham, but he really wanted, upon um, Graham's death, to remember this great man, um, who not only taught him, but really was responsible for a lot of the industrial chemistry upon which the wealth of 19th century Glasgow is based. Um, so there's a, a very important chemical industry in Glasgow. So this is one wealthy individual who's made a lot of money from industrial chemistry, thanking his teacher and thanking one of those men whose work has made the wealth of Glasgow possible. So he's here as a Glaswegian and he's here to represent Glasgow's new wealth. Okay, so here we are um, at the statue of Thomas Campbell, a poet. Uh, Campbell's also born in Glasgow, so he's another of the Glaswegians who appears in the square. Um, now, one particularly interesting thing about this one is that it was, um, it was designed by a John Mossman, or made by John Mossman, who is at this point uh, one of the great Scottish sculptors. He goes on to be one of the founders of the Glasgow School of Art, and he had started actually as a student of Baron Marachetti. Marachetti is the, um, the sculptor of the, um, the James Oswald statue um, that we saw earlier. And Marchetti is, is, is Italian-born, 
Um, and he comes to Britain and he's very involved in the sort of development of public statuary in Britain. Mossman's a Scot though and he learns the Marachetti and he brings Marachetti's techniques to Scotland. Um, his assistant on this um, statue was uh, James Pittendry from McGillwee, at this point a young man with a growing reputation, who had started as a student of William Bodie, the sculptor of the Thomas Graham uh, statue. And a couple of years later McGillwee goes independent, uh, starts to produce extremely important statuary all over the country, um, including uh, down in England, um, and is later actually knighted for his uh, work as a um, public sculptor. And he's, he writes the report, which is the found it was leads to the founding of the Edinburgh College of Art. So really what we have here with um, uh, coming from Marachetti through Brodie um, and through Mossman and into Pitt and Reith McGillway, the development of Scottish statuary tradition. So there's a history of art here that's being shown across these sculptors. sculptures. Now Campbell himself, um, at the time, he's an extremely famous poet, he's, he's generally quite forgotten now, famous for his patriotic um, songs and poetry, particularly associated with war um, and poems such as Ye Mariners of England. Um, so he's born in Glasgow, as I say, so he's here as a Glaswegian. And he's very specifically here as a Glaswegian, similar to Oswald, in that he arrives as a counterweight to a non-Glaswegian. When the Robert Burns statue arrives here, and Burns obviously is, is very well known across Scotland and in the west of Scotland, but the, the arrival of the Burns statue, or the intended arrival of the Burns statue, leads to a campaign to have a Glasgow poet remembered in Glasgow's great public square as well. And that's really why he comes here, as a Glaswegian and as a counterweight to a non-Glaswegian. OK, so here we are in front of two statues of military heroes. Uh, Lieutenant General Sir John Moore and behind me Field Marshal Lord Clyde. The John Moore statue is the very first one to arrive in George Square. It comes in in 1819. It's sculpted by John Flaxman. Now, when Moore arrives in the statue, as I said earlier, this is a domestic space and we're really now stood in the gardens of the housing around. The, the Victorian city has removed all that and we now have almost entirely Victorian buildings around the square apart from uh, just the one, the Millennium Hotel, which is uh, to my right over here, the, the last remaining Georgian building on George Square. So this is a fenced off private garden for the people who live here. And when Moore arrives, it's extremely controversial with the local residents who don't want it. They see that this, with the, their private garden, is being made into a public space as the city moves westwards. So although it's extremely popular when it first arrives and it's seen as the finest modern statue in Glasgow, it does extremely important work moving from classical sculpture into modern sculpture. Um, so he's, he's dressed in his modern dress, but it has the cape over him, um, like the old classical sculptures. You think of the Roman togas of the Roman um, statuary. But the residents try to vandalise it. They try to pull it down. Um, they try to damage it. They don't want it here. Um, but it becomes very much part of the square, although it has moved slightly, it was originally directly behind me um, in the middle um, of this side of the square. And the reason it was moved was to make space for Clyde as he arrived. Clyde was born in Glasgow, both of these gentlemen were born in Glasgow. Uh, he was born Colin McCliver. He then changed his name to Colin Campbell, Campbell being a good Scottish fighting name. Um, and then he'd be eventually uh, his way to the peerage as Lord Clyde. Moore died at the Battle of Corona, or was mortally wounded at the Battle of Corona, um, serving in the Peninsula Campaign, in which um, Clyde had served as a young soldier. He joined the army at the age of 15, um, served in the Peninsula Campaign and then in North America, Europe, the Caribbean, um, before um, uh, being raised to uh, a major um, and he goes to campaign in China and in India and he's actually the commanding officer of the thin, what's known as the Thin Red Line, the 47th, 42nd Black Watch at the Battle of Balaclava during the Crimean War. He then goes on to be commander-in-chief of the 
um, of the Indian Army or the British Army in India and is, is the commander responsible for the suppression of the Indian mutiny and serves indeed after the relief of Lucknow. And the interesting thing about this statue is how deeply imperialist it is. When the, when the council talks about how these statues aren't modern anymore and they don't represent um, modern Glasgow, the, the Clyde statue is perhaps the most controversial of all. He rests on a palm tree. He has in his right hand a pith helmet with a shroud. He, he's made to look like somebody serving in India. Glasgow at this point has become what's known as the second city of empire. It's one of the cities which benefits the most from the imperial connection, both with trade um, and with uh, shipping and, and so on. So for the council, of course, this is an imperialist hangover, which doesn't suit a modern Glasgow. And obviously um, there is a, a good argument in there. Um, but of course, actually, the importance of the empire and the development of Glasgow, whatever we may think of the empire now, cannot be ignored. It's the reason why this becomes a great Victorian city and becomes the largest city in Scotland and the second largest city in Britain. Um, so when he comes in, however, he's controversial for a completely different reason to Moore. Moore was wounded, mortally wounded, in battle. And he, he defeated Napoleon, famously, in battles. As opposed to Clyde, who is seen, well, he dies in his bed um, as a relatively elderly man. And uh, he seemed to have only defeated, and this is the quotes from the newspapers of the time, a few Indian chiefs. So he's seen as not as important um, as Moore. And the first debate over the movement of statues takes place because originally there'd been talk about removing Moore either to make way for Clyde or placing both Moore and Clyde in Royal Exchange Square which is just around the corner from us with the statue of the Duke of Wellington as a military trio and the newspapers of the time are full of people writing in saying Moore is a great man Clyde is not he should not be moved um, for Clyde and we start to also get the debates around whether we should have we should start to remove the tastes of earlier generations, which is obviously an argument which is then repeated whenever the square, um, the, there's talk of removing the statues from the square, including very recently indeed. Okay, so here we are in front of uh, two statues uh, to great Scottish writers. Sir Walter Scott, the novelist and poet, famous really for developing a Victorian sense of Scottishness, and Robert Burns, Scotland's national poet. Um, Scott is the second one to arrive in the square and he comes in in October 1832, just um, within a year of his death and he arrives 10 years before the famous Scott monument in Edinburgh. Now Scott has no connections to Glasgow. He's a borderer um, and he's well connected to Edinburgh, to the east of the country rather than to the west. And when he arrives here 10 years before the Edinburgh statue, one commentator of the time says that the Spartans of here shot ahead of the Athenians. The Athenians, of course, are the people of Edinburgh. Edinburgh is known at this time as, as the Athens of the north, as being the centre of the Scottish Enlightenment. The Spartans, of course, are the Glaswegians. Now really what's happening here, of course, is Glasgow is claiming a mantle from Edinburgh. There's no reason to have this famous Scottish writer here in Glasgow if we think of this as a Glasgow space. Edinburgh, of course, is the official uh, capital of Scotland, but Glasgow at this point is growing. It is becoming far more important industrially and financially and arguably culturally. So while it is not the official capital, the arrival of Scott is about the city claiming to be the new capital, the new cultural capital in particular of Scotland. And the same goes with the arrival of the Burns statue when he comes. Again, he is a West Coast man, um, but he's connected really with Ayrshire and with Dumfries. And so, again, uh, bringing in the national poet is very much about Scotland as the new, uh, sorry, Glasgow as the new capital of culture for Scotland. There are statues in Ayr, there are statues in Dumfries, the town's actually connected with them, and indeed there's one in Edinburgh as, as, as the capital, and this is a later one that comes in. But one of the other really interesting things about the Burns statue when it comes in is that the money for it is raised through, it's £2,000 raised through 40,000 separate subscriptions of a penny, or of tuppence, of tuppence, from working men and working men's associations and Burns clubs. 
So if we contrast that with the, uh, the statue of Graham, funded by a single wealthy individual, this, if you like, is a people's statue. This is the statue that the people of Glasgow have paid for, the people of Glasgow have wanted. And as soon as Scott goes in, there's a campaign for Burns to be represented as somebody who is more of the people than Scott, who's seen as a bit of a, a Tory patrician. So this is a Glaswegian people's statue. So here we are in front of the statue of James Watt, the great developer of the steam engine, um, the father, if you like, of the Industrial Revolution. Um, he's not originally from Glasgow, he's born in the town of Greenock, which is further uh, down the Clyde. But he moves to Glasgow at the age of 17 and does a lot of his important early work at Glasgow University. So there's a, a Glaswegian element to his life. He lives here, works here for 21 years before moving to Birmingham where he does his really important large work on the steam engine. And he is here because he is the father of the Industrial Revolution. The city here is saying thank you to Watt for the wealth that his development has, has brought to the city. Um, the weaving in the area and, and the ironworks and all the industry that has grown up in the Industrial Revolution really can be rested in large part on the work of Watt and his fellow engineers. So that's why he's here to represent modern Victorian industrial Glasgow. And he arrives quite early he arrives in the same year in fact as the Scott Memorial so and he appears in this corner and he's always sat in this corner looking towards what has become the new modern city of Glasgow the older city both the medieval and the 18th century city is over there to the east what is facing the new Victorian city OK, so here I am back between Moore and Clyde, the two military heroes. Now, the modern square, particularly because we have the cenotaph and the city chambers on the eastern side, it feels like it has an east-west axis. We're, so it all sort of points towards the city chambers over there. But actually, that's not the way the square was originally laid out. Scott looks to the south, he's got his side to the city chambers, which feels weird um, in, in the modern uh, layout of the square, but there's a very good reason for that. There's a parallelism to the actual layout of the statues. To my left and right immediately we have Moore and Clyde, the two uh, military heroes. Just behind them, um, to, further to the left and further to the right are Campbell and Burns, two poets. And in the far, far corners we have, on my left, we have Graham, and on my right we have Watt. So we have the two industrial scientists as well. There's a deliberate parallel here. Two military, two poetry, and two science. And originally, flanking the Scot, who's immediately behind me, were also the statues of Victoria and Albert, that we'll be looking at next. Two royal figures, again, parallel allowed each side of Scott and looking south. So while we now think of an east-west axis, the square originally was on a north-south axis because all of these statues face the Clyde. The River Clyde, on which is the modern basis of Glasgow, the centre of Glasgow, where the shipping, uh, the ships were built, the shipping went in and out, trading with the rest of the world. They are paying homage, if you like, to the river on which the city, the modern city, is now built. So here we are, stood between um, the statues of Victoria and Albert, Queen Victoria and the Prince Consort Albert. Victoria is actually the first one uh, that goes up, um, but it doesn't come up here in George Square. It's one of the two statues that's been moved in. It's originally um, put up in St Vincent Place, which is just around the corner, um, and is moved in here um, as a pair with Albert, when Albert comes in. And the Albert Memorial is one of those memorials that is raised on the death of Albert all across the country. Victoria famously uh, goes into deep mourning for many years um, after Albert dies uh, quite young. And there's, a, there's a, a lot of sympathy with this and an outpouring of emotion um, on behalf of Victoria across the country. And that's why Albert arrives. And the Albert statues has its Glasgow elements to it. Of course he has no connection to Glasgow whatsoever. He is here as a, as a royal figure. 
But one of the interesting things that's put on on the plinths, um, particularly on the one side, we've got representations of the industrial arts. That's how they're described at the time. So, for instance, on the south side, uh, on the plinth, on the plaque on the plinth, um, in the centre of it is the front of a locomotive. Glasgow is one of the great locomotive engineering uh, cities. And at one point, something like 80% of the world's or the empire's trains uh, engines are built here in Glasgow. So even though it's Albert, even though it's here as a royal statue, they still manage to make sure it looks like an industrial Glaswegian statue. Now both Albert and Victoria are um, designed and built uh, by Baron Marachetti, who also made the Oswald statue. Marachetti is Victoria's own personal favourite um, sculptor and it is she who insisted that the Albert statue was made uh, by him and it's his first one, uh, it's not, it's, sorry, it's his second one here uh, in Glasgow. He's already well known in Glasgow because of the statue of Wellington. Wellington is probably now the most famous statue in Glasgow. It's been uh, taken on by the citizens of Glasgow and famously um, it always has a traffic cone on its head which has become one of those sort of classic modern bits of visual imagery um, of Glasgow. Now the, the Victoria one that comes in, all of the other 12, 11 of the 12 that we're looking at today, they are memorials. They go up after their subjects are dead. Victoria's statue is put up first of all um, in St Vincent Place and then moved here as the pair with Albert during Victoria's lifetime. It is not a memorial statue. It's a very important statue in the development of uh, public statuary. It is the very first equestrian statue of a woman erected in Britain. It remains the only equestrian statue of Victoria. And equestrian statues of women are thought to be very, very difficult to do, not least because, of course, the women are always presented side saddle, which is a problem with the balance of an equestrian statue. But also, when you build an equestrian statue, you make the person on top larger than life, quite literally. If you look up at a, at a, a man sat on a horse, he looks quite small, because the horses are, of course, very big. And when you put a statue on a plinth, that proportions, those proportions can be even harder. And so you would make a particularly large man on top of a horse. And you can't do that with a queen because you would make the queen look very large. In the papers at the time there were worries that Victoria would be made to look gross. That's the words of the Glasgow Herald. And actually, um, Marachetti, when he completes this, it's seen as, as, a, as a really quite wonderful um, solution to that. She doesn't look enormous on it, um, and yet the proportions look very good. He's made the side saddle work very good, and it is seen as an extremely important um, equestrian uh, statue as a result. As was Wellington's when that went up, seen as unquestionably the finest equestrian statue in Britain at that time. Now, as I say, Victoria comes in um, during her lifetime. And there's a reason for this. It's not really a statue to Victoria. The crucial bits are the plaques on the plinths. On this, the south side that you can see behind me, uh, what we have is a representation of, Gla of Victoria in Greenock meeting the Lord Provost of Glasgow, James Robertson, and knighting him. He's the first Lord Provost to be knighted. And it happens on the very first visit by a monarch to Glasgow, by a British monarch to Glasgow. Nowadays, the Queen, she visits every town in Scotland and England and Wales. She's been all over. Uh, that's quite a normal thing for monarchs to do. But until the modern era, it was a very rare thing to do. Monarchs, if they travelled around the country, would merely be moving to the estates of the important members of the aristocracy and occasionally visiting extremely important cities. And when Victoria comes to Glasgow, this is the arrival of Glasgow as a truly great city. And the city sees it as an honour. And, and in particular, that knighting of the Lord Provost is seen as, as conferring an honour on the city through the body of the Lord Provost and that is why the actual moment of him being knighted with the sword on his shoulder is represented on the side of the statue. And here on the north side uh, we have a plaque showing uh, Victoria uh, being taken into the crypt of Glasgow Cathedral by the Minister of the Time. So again a, a moment from 
uh, Victoria's visit to Glasgow. This is a statue to, to memorialise her visit rather than the woman herself and the Queen herself. And in the background, very small, and it can just be made out, behind Glasgow Cathedral is Glasgow Necropolis, the big uh, new Victorian uh, graveyard. And right behind the cathedral, in clear view, is the John Knox Monument. Knox, who led the Reformation here in Scotland. And they've made sure that it appears uh, just behind uh, the minister. So it's here to represent the religiosity of Glasgow, the Protestantism, uh, the, the Scottish settlement, which of course is separate from the English religious settlement, which Victoria, as uh, Supreme Governor uh, in Matters Temple of the Church of England, uh, represents at this time. So here we have Sir Robert Peel, Tory Prime Minister. And as I said earlier, as we're talking about Oswald, it's extremely unpopular when it comes into the square because he is a Tory and he has no connections um, to Glasgow. And very early on, it becomes a centre of anti-conservative protest. And if there is a Tory protest in Glasgow uh, during the late Victorian period, it tends to centre on this statue. This is where they would uh, congregate for their protests. But Peel, of course, actually split the Conservative Party and broke away with what was called the, the Peelite tendency, which eventually forms, with the Whigs, the Liberal Party. So although he's a Conservative, um, he's somebody who splits the party. And what he splits the party over is the issue of free trade. Now, free trade at this time is a radical um, and, and particularly working class and middle class um, core celeb. They wish for free trade. Protectionism is the policy of the Conservative Party. And Peel brings forward free trade. And this is why Glasgow fathers, city fathers, want him in the square. Glasgow has become one of the truly great trading cities. And Peel, as the man who brings forward free trade as official government policy in Britain for the first time, is the man who made this great trade with the empire and this great trade with the rest of Britain and with America and with Europe possible. He's here as a free trader rather than as a conservative. So here we are in front of the last of the 12 statues we're going to be looking at, which was indeed the last one to arrive here in the square. William Ewart Gladstone, four times Liberal Prime Minister. He dies in 1898 and there's immediately a campaign here in Glasgow, a great Liberal city, uh, to raise a statue to him. Similar to the Burns statue, it's done by public subscription um, and actually uh, one of the largest public events that has ever taken place in the square is the unveiling of this statue. Uh, the next biggest, uh, the second largest, is indeed the unveiling of Burns. Now, Gladstone had started off as a Tory and indeed had split with the from the Conservative Party with Peel, been part of that Peelite faction that eventually migrated into the Liberal Party. The real character of this statue though, what really brings it out is if we compare it to the Edinburgh statue. Now the Glasgow statue, as we can see, is the only one we've seen where we have on the front of it the Glasgow City coat of arms. So it's actually been marked as Glaswegian. Um, Gladstone himself is not from Glasgow. He's born in Liverpool but of Scottish parents. His father is from Leith um, near Edinburgh and his mother is from Dingwall uh, in the north of Scotland. And he claims to have always had 100% uh, Scottish blood flowing through his veins. But he's not actually a Glaswegian. He's not actually Scottish born. But Glasgow here is claiming him. And they're doing it in other ways as well. The clothes that he is wearing are the ceremonial robes of the Lord Rector of Glasgow University, to which he was elected in 1879. Um, and as he's, he has his hand rested on a book to show his learning, but also connecting, obviously, um, to Glasgow University. It is a relatively plain statue. These are, again, the Spartans, in contrast with the Athenians, who have made the Edinburgh statue. And the Edinburgh statue is a far more florid uh, proposition entirely. It has a much larger plinth. It has the attributes all around it. Historia and Eloquentia are represented on it. He's dressed in the ceremonial robes in the Edinburgh statue of the, of the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Um, which he had been many, many times during his career, uh, famously during the Crimean War, and also at one point he was both Chancellor of the Exchequer and Prime Minister at the same time. So he is very much seen as a financial man. 
On the front of the statue, um, there is a, a, a stone kite, um, a, a, a bird of prey, very well known in Scotland. The old Scots word of which is a gled. And it's made in stone. And the Gladstone name comes from gled stains. So they put a stone gled on the front of Gladstone. It's a, a, it's a Scottish antiquarian in-joke. It would not have been understood by many, only really the Scots antiquarians who we might associate with um, the great sort of learned societies of Edinburgh. And flanking um, that kite um, are two boys holding ribbons on which are uh, included two quotes from Homer in the original Greek. Again, something that would not have been understood by the vast majority of people uh, wandering past um, this Edinburgh statue. But, of course, Gladstone himself is a Homeric scholar, but also Edinburgh is the Athens of the North, and it sees itself as a great home of classical learning. So what's happening here is Edinburgh the financial city, Edinburgh, the city of Scots antiquarianism, and Edinburgh, uh, the city of classical learning, is representing all of those attributes on its statue to Gladstone. As we look around the Glasgow statue, we've seen him in the, the robes of the Lord uh, Rector of the University, we've seen the coat of arms, but we also have the two plaques, the relief plaques on each side. The plaque on the east side depicts Gladstone uh, delivering um, a speech at the dispatch box in the House of Commons, doing political work. And the relief plaque on the, uh, on the west side depicts him in, in an image you might think is quite surprising for a Prime Minister. He's got his sleeves rolled up, he's leaning on an axe, his family has sat on the trunk of a tree which he has just chopped down, and at the base of the tree next to him you can see where he's been hacking away, although the tree is not yet down yet. Gladstone famously chopped down trees for exercise. He didn't just do it for exercise, of course, in the larger states. These, this was where you got your firewood from and the trees would be kibbled afterwards. And he kept it going right up until his late 70s, chopping down trees for exercise. But it is also, of course, a great gift for political iconography. And it's a very popular image in particular amongst his working class supporters. So if you visit um, his, his home now, which is still in the Gladstone family, and you go into his, what was his library at the time, what he called his Temple of Peace, it is all around it there are ceremonial carved axes that were donated to him by some of his working class supporters, by deputations that would come and visit him at his home. It can be used to show him attacking the House of Lords at its root, or the Church of Ireland, or the Conservative Party. So the axe appears a lot in punch cartoons of the time, and Gladstone is attacking his various opponents with his axe. But for his working class supporters, it has more than just this political message. It also shows him as a man of physical labour. So here in Glasgow, what we've got is a statue of him with political work, of physical labour, in clothes representing Glasgow, and with the city coat of arms. The Edinburgh statue can be seen as Edinburgh's statue of Gladstone, Edinburgh's version of Gladstone, but is also Edinburgh's vision of itself. And here in the Gladstone statue, he may not be a, Gladsto uh, a Glaswegian himself, this is, but this is not just Glasgow's vision of Gladstone, this is Glasgow's vision of itself. So even when we don't have a Glaswegian, what we have here is a genuinely, truly Glaswegian statue. And that is why the statues are important. The statues of a whole tell us the history of Glasgow and they tell us how Glasgow understood itself and continues to understand itself um, to this day.